Hi, I'm Ted Balaker with Reason.TV. Today I'll be speaking with Roger Nygaard, who has directed television shows such as The Office and The Bernie Mac Show. Roger is the director of the celebrated documentary Trekkies, and his new project, The Nature of Existence, promises to explain the mysteries of the universe in 90 minutes. Stick around and hear Roger's take on directing, the rise of fan culture, religion, and why people get so angry when their beliefs get challenged. How'd you first get into filmmaking? I've just been making films ever since I can remember. It was something I've always been interested in, and I've just kept doing it. And luckily, I've been able to get paid to do it, you know, since uh, I think 1991 was when I turned pro. Starred uh, Julie Brown, Kevin Nealon, and David Spade before uh, David Spade got on SNL. So how did you move from something like on the, the Monsters level to the, to the office, the Bernie Mac show level? You just keep building. Somebody once told me, and, and I think it's true, it takes five years to make every big step in the film business. So you start out with your little amateur productions, and then you finally maybe write a script, and you make a short film, which leads to somebody seeing it, hopefully, and then get, giving you an offer to direct something, and really low budget, and maybe that leads to something. And, uh, and if it doesn't, you just start all over again, try it again. You have something like The Office, which started as, as a British version and has become you know, wildly successful here in the States as well. How much of it, it was sort of ready-made, just the style of the humor for an American audience versus you had to tweak it for an American audience? The American version of The Office certainly found its own groove, and I think that's why it became a success. You can't just copy something directly. You've got to reinvent it because every culture is a little bit different. American culture is a little different from British culture. You know, they've got a German office. You know, th they're franchising the office to other countries. And in each one, it gets tweaked a little bit because humor doesn't always travel. For the folks who may have not seen it yet, what's the logline on Trekkies? It's a documentary about some of the more exceptional fans of Star Trek. And one of the most exceptional was uh, a young man named Gabriel. I'm going right now to pick up my new tailor-made Star Trek first contact uniform. Everything that came out of his mouth was gold. Linda Thuringer, our club's captain and Garrick impersonator, really outdid herself here, except I do have a couple minor quibbles, like uh, the red stripe here. In the actual movie, it's going to be about half this thickness. Here at Reason.TV, of course, Drew Carey's a big deal for us, and, and he was a big fan of Trekkies. Uh, can you tell me about him hooking up with Gabriel? <laughs> Drew Carey saw Trekkies, and we heard about it because we got a phone call at the production office from Drew Carey's office saying, hey, we want to find that kid, Gabriel. And they ended up casting Gabriel on the Drew Carey show for two episodes to play a Star Trek fan of some kind. It was kind of flattering that, oh, Drew Carey saw the movie and liked it. Can you talk about the rise of, of fan culture? I mean, certainly it's epitomized in something like, like Trekkies. It's sort of what every television show would dream of, having this, this bottom-up, grassroots fan culture. What accounts for that? The thing about Star Trek is that people like to lose themselves in a TV show. And Star Trek was the one science fiction show uh, or literature that portrayed a positive future where human beings are progressing and people are equal, and men and women, minorities, everyone has an equal chance. Science fiction tends to be the place where we project our doomsday scenarios. And S Star Trek was the opposite of that, and it drew people to that positive portrayal. My new film is called The Nature of Existence. And the subtitle that I like is, All the Mysteries of the Universe Explained. Why are we here? Is there an afterlife? Where is it? What is the soul? Uh, what is sin? Does prayer work? If so, where was God during the Holocaust? And now I've interviewed hundreds of people all over the world asking these same questions. I interviewed Baba lovers, Mare Baba, from Hindu gurus to Jainists, talked to atheists, Satanists, and uh, Native Americans, rabbi in Israel, uh, an archbishop in Rome, Confucianists and Taoists in China. China is held to be an atheistic country. Confucianism and, and Taoism are not 
truly deistic religions. But they are really superstitious. I think every human nature is super, has, is, has superstition built into it in some way. I was interviewing um, a woman in Beijing and I asked her about religion, which religion did she prefer, if any, and she said, I don't believe in, in any sort of, of religion. And then in the next sentence, she was telling me how she believes that if there, you find a snake on the roof of your house, you should leave it because it brings good luck. And if you shoo it away, it'll bring disaster. So, so you're still, there's, that's still a belief in some f unknown force that you can influence through your actions. Why do people get so angry when their beliefs are challenged? Everyone had the same answer, that if you truly believe whatever it is that you profess to believe, you, ha you have no doubt in your mind. You, you don't get angry when someone questions it. You, you, you discuss it. You, you have an answer for why. If you have doubts, you get angry at someone for shining a light on your own doubts. If someone is very angry because you're challenging them, it's because they're trying to keep themselves convinced of whatever the doctrine is that, that, it, that they profess to believe. They very rarely say, well, well, thank you, friend, for setting me straight. Oh, yeah. You, you, you can never change someone's mind. I mean, rarely. If you had to, say, drive cross-country with one of the folks that you interviewed, who, who comes to mind? Oh, I've done it. I did it with a preacher, an evangelical, what do you call himself, a confrontational evangelist. <laughs> really? I drove across country with uh, Brother Jed. He goes from college to college, preaching, f fire and brimstone, th that, that type of uh, good old-fashioned, you know, you're all going to go to hell if you uh, don't stop listening to rock and roll and drinking beer and all the other bad things. And he was, uh, he's something else. He's very entertaining. He stayed at my house, you know, because uh -huh. uh, you know, he, he goes from place to place. He doesn't have money. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what, you're free to use the guest room. <laughs> Open invitation? Yeah. Can you still we're going to, you know, he might see this online. <laughs> He's been there <laughs> once. Come, come back anytime, Open Brother invitation. Jed. Anytime. <laughs>